The following episode of the Maui Chamber of Commerce's Business Matters was originally broadcast on September 3rd, 2024. It's time now for Business Matters, brought to you by the Maui Chamber of Commerce. And now, here's your host, the president of the Maui Chamber of Commerce, Pam Tumpop. Good morning, Pam. How was your long weekend, Pam? Was it a good one? Oh, I had a wonderful long weekend on Labor Day. How about you, Gary? Yeah, well, I had a, a half a day off. <laughs> <laughs> there is always that. We always need those key people keeping things running. <laughs> there you go. I'm an essential worker. Uh, you are an essential worker. I hear, Yes, I would agree with that wholeheartedly, all the time, sadly. <laughs> Some days, though, you just need some breaks. Yes, you do. Well, uh, thank you for all you do for our show, and I hope everybody had a wonderful Labor Day. Uh, we have amazing people in town with the SBA, who's been you know on the front lines with us as we go through the wildfires, and a number of people in, are in town as an upcoming congressional hearing this week. So I had a fabulous time yesterday spending time with the SBA team and uh, just getting to know them personally while also, you know, talking about the upcoming work they'll be doing this week as they prepare for the hearing. So it, it was a lot of fun yesterday. And this morning we're going to have even more fun. So thank you for joining us. We're going to speak with Council Chair Alice Lee, she is running for re-election, so I just want to note that this message is an in-kind contribution towards her campaign, valued at $175, and paid for by the Maui Chamber of Commerce Political Action Committee. And we're going to talk to her not about the campaign, uh, but we do need to make that message available to the public. But we are going to talk to her about a lot of issues before us as we continue to move forward from the wildfires, and rebuild our community. And then we are going to talk to a very interesting visual artist, Ariel Heroes. I, I hope I'm not butchering that. We'll learn more when he comes on, of Maui Wedding Art, and learn more about Ariel. So uh, very excited to be having a great conversation this morning. Starting with Council Chair Alice Lee, I just want to mention she holds the county seat for Wailuku, Waihe'e, and Waikapu residency area. Previously, she served for 10 years on the county council from 1989 to 1999 and served as the former director of housing and human concerns from 1999 to 2006. She has advocated for key initiatives that have affected our quality of life on Maui for a very long time. And so I just would like to welcome her. Good morning, Alice. How are you this morning? Good morning, Pam. Uh, thank you for inviting me here. And uh, I am ready to go, starting a brand new week. <laughs> I say a brand new week. Did you have a good Labor Day weekend? Oh, I had a wonderful weekend with the family. And now uh, I'm a little rested, except it was so hot. I can't believe how, how hot it was. My, even my dog was complaining. <laughs> I, I have heard so many people say that, and it was just unusually hot. Some people were saying they didn't want to walk the dog on the street, their poor little paws. Yeah, right. it was a, it was an unusual day. Yes. Well, I you know really want to thank you for your your decades long service, and also for the work that you have continued to do in housing. And I know that. Um, uh, making our community sustainable and, and making sure that we take care of our families and we have a place for our children to be able to come home to and live in and build, you know, their family and life here is so important to you. Can you talk about in this time when we had a crisis before the wildfires and now, of course, uh, the wildfires have exacerbated the, you know, the challenge and number of units needed how do we move housing forward at this point? What do you feel are the top priorities to really get on with moving housing forward? Well, honestly, one of the ways to move housing forward is to um, have government be uh, less restrictive. Now, as yeah. you know, I've been in this business for a very long time, 
And when I was the housing director at that time, we didn't have a crisis at the level we have today and for the last several years. Um, yeah. 20 years ago, you could buy a house for $180,000, you know? Right. And then, but then things happened. Um, the county council, for some reason, after I left the council, uh, decided to require a 50% requirement for, if you build housing, 50% would have to be affordable. Right. And I was I was strongly against it because I felt it would have the opposite effect. And sure enough, it did. So yes, we were against it as well. Yeah. Well, with 50% of a requirement, the project no longer pencils out. Right. So for what, what happened... From about 2006 all the way to about 2015, um, <clears throat> very little affordable housing was built as a result. So then the council at that time, and and I was there to testify also, to change it back yes. to 25, 25% requirement. And then yes. at that time, projects began to move forward. But again, for some reason, the, the some legislators, some council members, equate a strict requirements to producing affordable housing. People don't realize, council members, at some of them don't realize that it takes just a lot, a lot more than just changing the rules to make it more rigid and more, more uh, stringent to make something happen. Positive things right. will not happen when you tighten, you know, when you tighten the rules. What has to happen is the county council and the administration has to ensure that there is sufficient water, that there yes. is sufficient sewer treatment capacity, and traffic mitigation. And that, that should be our main focus. And let everything else fall in place as far as development. Now... If the council wanted to have a stronger control over housing, then the county should provide the housing. Mm -hmm. so, and, and, and it's still possible. The county can provide yeah. the lower-end housing, and uh, developers can, can provide the workforce housing. I'm not talking yeah. market. I'm talking workforce housing. Workforce, yeah. So, you know, it, it, yeah. You know, if, you, if we could change our philosophy to that, we would be uh, much more successful in producing affordable housing for our people. I wholeheartedly agree. Can you share with our audience who maybe doesn't understand the, um, the difference between, you know, sort of a lower end, uh, very affordable and workforce housing? Okay, the, the lower end would be, you know, maybe 60% and below because, but, but then, you know, People need to keep in mind, you have to give people um, our residents choices. In other yes. words, for those who are earning 60% of the median income, many of them will have increases in their salaries, you know, promotions over time. Yeah. So yes, you want correct. them to be able to step up into a, a little bit more expensive home, but mm -hmm. still affordable. So. Our job is to ensure that people have a, a variety of price ranges to choose from, and not just the low end. Because when you when you don't give people choices beyond the low end, they will stay there. They won't move, and that's not what you want. You want people to move move upward wherever possible, and and that's another yeah. consideration for those who are working on housing project, you know, it's, it, as far as the county is concerned, you know, we can start with the low end, but we need to in, incentivize um, others who are building housing to produce a range of prices so people can move upwards and those at the lower end can make room for the next group of people at the lower end. That's and right. this will <laughs> certainly have a positive effect in reducing homelessness. It, it, it is. It's a system and a plan, and it's giving people opportunities to start it at the lower end 
build some equity. You know, for uh, again, even you know, now we're talking more again about apartments. And and when I started out, I lived in apartments in my Luzu, which allowed me to save money. And so there there were ways to start building some equity so that you could move up in a continuum. Uh, Harbor Lights was a great way of very affordable condominium ownership. And right. I was able to do that. And when I sold my condo, the money I made from the sale of the condo was a down payment on a house. I so think that's the path that. most right. most people generally follow. I mean, I, I certainly did that. When I moved back after school, when I graduated, I came back to Maui to live, okay. got married, lived in a condo for two years, but as we built our home in Pukalani, you know. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you always have opportunities to move forward. Um, most local people are not speculators. You know, right. like where I live now in Wailuku, on my street, out of 16 uh, families, only two have, have actually sold their homes. So in general, local folks are not going to speculate because, and that's the reason why you, you don't want to deprive them of the ability to use their equity. Because, right. for instance, my, for, for me, even at this stage of my life, we did an equity loan for my grandson's college education. You know, so yes. there's always things you have to pay pay for. Yeah. Right. And that's why I don't like when we um, restrict the building equity. And, you know, I, I have a problem with that one because in general, of course, you're going to have one or two people who abuse the system, but in general, people don't. And they use their uh, equity funds for good reasons, you know, whether it's uh, student law, I mean, you know, college, education, illnesses, uh, that's buying right. a car, you know, there's so many things that retirement, you have retirement, yeah. all of these things are important. And this is, you know, a person's main uh, investment in their lifetime, their house is their main investment for most people. So that most yeah. people are not going to use their main investment to keep speculating. But anyway, yeah, that's a, that's that's, you know, I, yeah, well, I, I'm hoping that more, more and more folks will understand that the government should be providing more of the basics, water, infrastructure, roads, parks, you know, basic services. And then, you know, let the housing developers develop the housing. Because yeah, you know, our, our 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 resources are limited as well as, as you probably know. We have um, over two hundred vacancies in the county. Yeah, you know we have vacancies, and what does that mean? That means we cannot implement many projects as a result. So yeah. you know, in some cases, our our hands are tied. I'll, I'll give you an example of the. The chief of police, and I, one of the main projects I've been working on lately is to develop an arson squad and fire prevention unit within the fire department in conjunction with the police department. Uh huh. And you know the the um, the fire department says, well, yeah, you, that that would be great, but we also need a a, a new uh, fire station in Oluwalu and mm -hmm. and Haiku. And I said. Yes, yeah. let's do all three at the same time. <laughs> because no, no, be, because because yes, they're needed. And, and, no, that's what we need. It. Yeah, and and so and a lot of these things you can you can uh, outsource. Yes, so you don't right. need people within the department to yes. initiate these projects. Uh, so yeah. what I'm saying is, let's initiate these projects and and let's move forward and not do one at a time because fire. Fire prevention become a uh, necessary um, goal, objective on our part. And we have to prevent other towns from burning. Let's face it, yeah. with the climate change and the droughts and the lack of rain and all of these things converging on Maui, we have to be more aggressive in fighting these things and 
as far as prevention, prevention of fires. And so we are in particular looking at, you know, um, in Wailuku, the Pihana area, uh, where the Macnut fields are, yeah. we get calls all the time. And we have to do something, you know. You can't just, you know, say, well, we wish we could. No, you have to do something. We have to do something. And no, even really upcountry, you know, even if it's yeah. just to, for now, to ensure, and in Lahaina as well, all over South Maui, uh, make sure that fire breaks are cut at the very least. At the very least, right. You know, I was, and I remember you. We, you were so involved in this during the time, but years ago, there was this image floated throughout our community when people felt that they wanted cane burning to stop, and and we heard, you know, they were saying that uh, that the cane burning burning process and HDNS, you know, were doing terrible things to our community, and I remember this image that was floated around that showed that if, if cane burning continued, it was it was going to be gray and ugly and devastation and smoke all over the sky. And, and, and if we stopped cane burning, we had this beautiful green sunshine and rainbows and, and just beautiful utopia picture of Maui. And of course, the lack of all of that beautiful sugar cane that kept things green, but the HDNS team who used to help us put out fires because they knew about how to control fires. Um, we have surely missed them in these times. And and now yes. the image is flipped. What they said we were going to have were projected and, and got people so engaged in saying we have to make this big change and and uh, stop the sugar cane burning. What, what I think many are coming to realize, especially as you point out, with climate change and other things is, is unfortunately we had more of a utopia when we had the cane and beautiful green all over our island. And now, without all of that, we're seeing more challenges and destruction. Yes, and, and that's the reason why we need to adjust and adjust quickly. We, you know, we, yeah. As you said, we, you know, we had many more resources to fight fires in the past, with the plantations being active, but but when they went out of business, uh, you know we needed to to change. But in addition to them going out of business, climate change became yeah. more of a force to deal with. You know, we we it's drier, and then we we also have people who intentionally start fires. And we had yeah. many of those in the past, except the plantation folks would deal with that. Now we don't have the plantation folks to deal with the arsonists. So that's the reason why I'm trying to create an arson squad. So yes. the, the idea is, th there's one thing about change. It cannot be denied. It's going to happen. So what we have to do is be proactive and and move forward before, you know, the accidents and the crises come to try and prevent them or at least reduce them to the extent possible. That's true. Very true. One of the other things that uh, I know you're very well aware of and the council is, is, has uh, put forward uh, money to an active study is the mayor's proposal on SPRs. Uh, we've got a lot of people in our community ringing in on this, um, and it's a, it's a huge issue. I, I talk to businesses every day, and, and they're deeply concerned about, you know, our visitor count and what the impact of that might be, um, but of course also tempered with the, the importance of housing, as we've discussed, and the need for housing. But the question is, is this the right way to go? Can you share some of your thoughts on the mayor's proposal and how the council's going to move forward? and you know, any any ideas of where you see a sweet spot in a solution on this? Yeah, well, as, to start, we have uh, a different approach to this issue. The council authorized a study to be done, uh, a little over three hundred thousand dollars. We, the, our staff, would 
was um, busy with a procurement process and I believe selected uh, a consultant and that study should begin uh, momentarily, that, that quickly. So they are going to, uh, whomever the consultant is, is going to review all current studies and analyze all current studies and then uh, create a list of all units impacted and go over, you know, analyze the age, the classification, assess value, number, number of bedrooms and bathrooms, parking stalls, storage areas, all the things that question or bring into focus whether or not uh, banning STRs is, uh, is feasible. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I think, <clears throat> according to a study that was taken by SMS, it, it appears that um, a fairly small percentage want to prohibit all STRs. What I think people want to do is ensure that all illegal STRs are eliminated. Right. But That's over right. time, over time, I think we need to have more of a balance as far as revenue yeah. diversification, economic diversification. And in the past and even now, we're a little bit too reliant on the visitor industry. So mm -hmm. now is that our opportunity to to put everything back in balance and not right. over rely Absolutely. on the visitor industry. And so so yes, I think there is um, there there are benefits to phasing out or at least reducing the uh, STRs and especially if you uh, all, um, you designate the, the resort areas for STRs and then as those apartments, maybe those are the ones that we question whether we need them in the apartment district or not. Mm -hmm. But the study will the study will give us more information. We need a yeah. basis for good judgment for good decision making. Right now we don't. We only have bits and pieces of information. So what we want is that study to be fin finished and then, then we'll have a, you know, a rationale for whatever we do going forward. The, the problem, one of the concerns I have and you know other council members as well, is the money that we're going to lose. So right. knowing that if we phase, if we time this correctly, you know, we time this correctly, we could bolster other industries to offset the monies we're going to lose from the STRs. So, yes. we are not only going to lose our real property taxes, we're going to lose transit accommodation taxes, we're going to lose GEP taxes. And, right. and from all accounts so far, we're looking at upwards of over $100 million. So if that's wow. a lot of money to lose because people don't see that $100 million is what pays for roads, parks, right. yeah, infrastructure, services, <laughs> yeah. services police, yeah. fire, everything. You know. yeah. So imagine if your personal budget was cut by one third. Well, you know, then, you know, then, then you can understand, wow, that's a lot to cut. So, um, you know, we, we need to take a, a strong look. Our real property taxes, uh, you know, it, it's hard for us to keep taxing these folks more. They already pay, uh, as an example, it's for SDRs in the lowest tier, it starts at $12.50 per thousand. And it goes up right. to $15 per thousand. Owner occupant, well, let's not even go there. Let's say long term rental. Start yes. at three dollars, but then it goes up to eight dollars. So the difference yeah. is what we would lose, yeah, right. if we turn these units into the short term rentals into long term rentals. We lose the difference of collecting twelve to fifteen dollars per thousand down to three dollars and eight dollars per thousand. So that's yeah. a lot of money, and then that that doesn't and we, even include the the multiplier effect, the trickle down effect of yeah, all the jobs right. associated with all of these uh, having SPRs and all of them 
restaurants and maintenance folks and all the suppliers and all of the people involved and related to this industry would lose their jobs. So we have yeah. to be careful how we handle this so that we don't end up in a worse economic situation than we are now. Because as you know, we have the settlement monies to pay um, and other costs associated with recovery and rebuilding. And so we, uh, we thought we were on the road to set having a settlement, but now that's thrown into question with the insurance companies getting involved and perhaps slowing down the process or possibly changing the process. Yes, I've seen that on the news, which is which is really tragic as we're starting to see uh, how that is coming into play. And and I and I want to say that I really appreciate the council saying on this issue. We're gonna we're gonna take a very comprehensive look because we we also can and you know, and and what's happened in our community given the again the 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 long standing going way back to our housing crisis people are so frustrated that we're sort of jumping on this solution or that solution and really mm-hmm. ugly horrible things are being said about people I mean. Uh, one person is calling them, you know, if you own a condominium, if you own something that has been approved as a as a short-term rental for decades in the resort area, and we're calling them traitors or ugly things, I, I really encourage people to not get into the hype, look at the issue, understand the issue. In some cases, there are housing solutions available that would be more appropriate and less costly than some of the things that might be done under um, taking over the the STRs, and also to just continue to operate within the Aloha spirit and and listen to our leaders who are working on this, listen to what the council is doing with the study, get involved and get her engaged. I think uh, one of the testifiers, you know, who, who was very frustrated by housing. One of the things that he, I think he said very aptly recently was, you know, with, it, it, with, with housing and taking that housing stress off of our community, we will have more aloha. And I think the frustration is a lot of our local residents with the housing crisis feel very left behind. In it. And, and it's not visitors over locals, but we need to change a longstanding system. And we are making great strides, and we we want to focus on housing for all of our local families and for future generations. And it's critical, um, but it's also critical to look at systems holistically. And as you said, have the tools to make these critical decisions. Billy, it yes, um, <clears throat> for for us as elected officials, <clears throat> I think people use us as target practice most. Of- a lot of the time, yes, and they you do, know, it, it, it's important for us to rise above and yeah. be, be focused on the goals, the higher goals, and not worry about the the shots that we're we're getting, the slings and arrows, because they're not from the majority of people; it's from some of the people. But, you know, and our job is to work for all of the people and okay. and to ensure, like, we have just, if I'm fortunate to be reelected, I just have a few more years left and to to finish my term and to finish our segment of our work, okay? Because we're not going to solve all the problems in three or four years. That's impossible. Okay. But what we want to do is to make sure that the, the next group of people to take over will have less of a burden going forward. And that's what we, that is our goal. So I try very hard not to worry about or let, you know, uh, detractors derail me from, from my, you know, from my intentions and from my objectives and my goals because I want to make sure that the next group of people have have advantages that we did not have and that they can right. carry the ball forward 
and for the next group of people. And and that's how it should be. There, there is no way we can solve all the problems, but we certainly can reduce them. And that's a, that's really a, a, you know, a tangible thing that we have to all strive for. Absolutely. Well, for those who don't maybe understand what happens with terming out, this, this is probably a great place. I, I know we've done a little bit over, too, um, and I'm going to have to have you back because we have a million more questions to ask of you. Um, but maybe for those who aren't familiar what's happening moving forward into the next election, what we're looking at in terms of number of council members who would term out. Yeah, uh, okay, so depending on the Charter Amendment, I think we all have an extra term, which I really wasn't planning to, you know, take advantage of. If if I just continue on my track, I have uh, two more terms, and that's it. And um, and that's all I would ask for, you know. And mm-hmm. I have no intentions of... I, I'm I'm not using this as a stepping stone to another job. I'd be happy I'd be happy to retire after two more terms, and so, um, but others. But and and then as far as that goes, there's six of us in that same boat. Actually, five of us. Yuki was there before, so she has, you know, she's she has one term more than us. But or if you, um, six of us are started at the same time. There's one of Yuki who started one term before, and then two people, Tom Cook and Nohe Uhuhajin, are in there finishing up their first term. So when all six of us leave, that's going to create a big void. And you know, uh, when we leave, a whole bunch of experience leaves at the same time. And believe me, no matter what anybody says, no matter what anybody says, there is no substitute for experience. This job is not something you can read about or watch a video on or anything like that. You have to go through it. And yeah. and then, too, it, it helps to have lived here a long time. That's right. Because if you don't understand the culture and you, you're not part of it and you don't have roots here, you don't have, you know, uh, any in, in stakes here, you know, um, then it's just easy to, to pick up and leave. And that's not the yeah. kind of person you want. You want the person who's going to be in the trenches and working and not giving up. That's the kind of person you want for this job. So, you know, in the future, I, I suggest to everybody, Think about that, you know. And as you know, a lot of us, Pam, started with nonprofits. Uh, yes, so yeah. we, <laughs> you did. We, we worked in a not we we worked in a nonprofit arena for yep. years before we even thought about running for office. But is yep. but it is a natural progression, Com, you know, uh, from community service to public service. That's a natural progression. So if, 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 at the very least, if you spend a lot of time in the nonprofit arena, to me that qualifies you, or pretty much qualifies you, to move on to public service. Yeah. So it is a good progression. Another, You're right. That's an excellent point. As we, as you know, uh, we we want to. That in in that we always say at the chamber we do do candidate endorsements, and we are in that topic now. Um, but we always say, as as we see people wanting to run for office, one of the things we're looking for is what public service did they do? How engaged are they in the community? You know, are they engaged in, in serving nonprofits? Uh, what kind of uh, activities do they do in that realm? What kind, Are they engaged in the process, testifying at the county and state level? Um, you know, are they leading kids as as a troop leader or, you know, what are they doing to really show leadership in the community? And uh, it's really important. Um, it gives them a broader view when people move from the nonprofit service in the public office. Uh, but you, you want people coming into public office that have experience, demonstrated leadership, demonstrated community involvement, how they, you know, how they look at determining 
their decision making process and how they're going to think through things and what experience do they bring to the table and so um Yep, I agree with everything you said, Alice. I, I want to <laughs> thank you for being on the show. We're, we're going to uh, turn it over to our next guest, but I know he had more questions, so I I would love to have you on again in a short period of time so we can continue the discussion. I'd be happy to return anytime. Thank you so much. I hope you have a wonderful Maui day. Thank you. You too. Aloha. Thank you. Aloha. All right. Well, well, as Gary uh, reaches out to our next guest, and Gary, if you will uh, introduce him when he comes in with the correct pronunciation of his last name, so I don't butcher it, but I would uh, like to just tell you folks a little bit about Ariel, and, and we'll get his correct last name just to make sure that we've got it right. He is a talented visual artist and the creative force behind Maui Wedding Art, specializing in live wedding paintings and personalized artwork. He was born in Chile in 1981, and Ariel's passion for art became, began at a really young age, leading him to pursue a formal education in visual art techniques, where he graduated with honors in 1999. His artistic journey has taken him from Chile to Brazil, Mexico, and finally to Maui, Hawaii, where he has lived since 2013. With over 20 years of experience, Ariel has developed a unique style that blends his portraiture experience with Hawaii's vibrant landscape and rich culture. His philosophy is art is related to love. And it is at the heart of his work. He uh, does live wedding paintings, and they capture the essence of the, uh, of the couple's love story, providing a unique and memorable experience that reflects the beauty of their special day. His dedication to creating lasting memories through art has made Maui Wedding Art a trusted choice for couples seeking unforgettable wedding keepsakes. Gary, do we have Ariel on? Yes, we do. It's Ariel Kidos. Kitos. Oh, wonderful. Aloha, Ariel, and welcome to Business Matters. Aloha. Can you, uh, I just give a brief introduction about you, and can you tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, th this passion of yours and how you started this business? Yeah, thank you so much. So, um, I moved to Maui on 2013. And I'm being a portrait artist uh, almost all my life. I've always been interested in um, doing portraits of people. Um, uh, when I moved to Maui, uh, the first couple of years was a little bit challenging for me to adapt to the culture here and the economy, et cetera. But uh, thanks to Maui Hands and another gallerist that uh, yeah. gave me opportunities on Front Street. Uh, I started like, uh, working as an art consultant in Maui and also uh, as an artist in residence. And I joined the, um, uh, the exhibition on the Banyan Tree with the Lahaina Art Society. So yeah. that gave me like a, a, like a nice kickstart to start like my art business. But uh, when I encounter like the wedding industry and I start doing uh, wedding paintings, I feel like I found like my true passion, and I'm I'm very grateful with the with that opportunity to bring people uh, to some artistic uh, enhancement of their ceremony, and uh, I really love to do that right now. Oh, I, I think it's wonderful. Um, I, I'm actually, as, as you're talking, I'm actually looking at your, your website, and we will be sharing it with everybody uh, in case you're, you're wanting to listen to the, the conversation and also look at the, the um, amazing work he does. It's MauiWeddingArt.com. Uh, yes. So tell us a little bit about, because you have a whole process involved. I was just looking at the website and seeing it. You have a whole process involved in, in steps to be taken as you are getting ready to capture this art and do the painting. I'm so sorry. Can you repeat that question again? Yes. I, I said I, I'm looking at how you, how you ha engage 
the people who you're going to do the paintings for, how you engage them in a process uh, to gear up and get ready for doing the painting. Oh, yeah. So, um, so first I tried to get with the couple a uh, phone consultation to see if I need to include something special on their painting. So uh, sometimes they require to uh, get their pet dog uh, included on the picture. They're not going to be on the ceremony, but they can send me a picture of their dog. Sometimes they want their parents or somebody who was deceased on the picture. So uh, I can include that too. And sometimes people want some guests around uh, uh, of the ceremony. So I personalize each painting depending on each client. So that's the first step. Uh, so I have a, a, an idea. So sometimes I need to visit the location because if I don't, I'm not been at the location before, uh, I, I like to scout the location. I talk with the wedding planners uh, about like where it's going to be the best place for me to set, do my setup. Uh, yeah. So on the day of the wedding, I like to arrive earlier. Uh, so I have a little bit of time before the ceremony to do a quick plein air background of the painting. So that, that will be always like uh, the beach with some islands on the background or some special tree that help you to identify the location. Uh, so let's say at the Andas, they have a wonderful uh, gala tree right there that is very unique. So I like to portray that tree before they put the arch. And when uh, then the people come to do the florals and the wonderful people, they come, to, they, they put the arch and I can set up like where it's going to be the arch. And during the ceremony, I mostly focus on taking pictures of the couple. Uh, mm -hmm. So... Uh, I, I always try to be behind of everybody so I don't interfere with the ceremony. Uh, so when the people, everybody's looking to the room and bride, I'm taking pictures of the room and bride. And then I move all my setup to the uh, reception area and I uh, work on the portrait of the couple right there. And at the end of the night, the people uh, can see the virtually done process. I always like to take yeah. a painting uh, back to my studio to let it dry and finish some last retouching uh, so that enhanced the, the, the whole painting. Uh, but uh, at the end of the night, the people can see like a virtually final product. That is amazing. Uh, what, I'm just so fascinated by the whole thing and, and how you've, you've put it together. I, I know that Thank also you. you look to blend Hawaii culture in with your painting? Yes, yeah, so uh, usually the, the the people, they like to include on the ceremonies some uh, Hawaiian elements. Uh, I really like uh, when the people, they're sharing, sharing breath on uh, that, like what many people, they call it the Hawaiian kiss, when they're touching mm -hmm. their front heads and, and they're very close to each other. I think that's... The honey, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, the, with with the, with the honey, it's it's kind of like for me like the essence of aloha, right? So I I, I yeah. hear somebody describing the aloha as uh, recognizing like another person, and that's very beautiful and very special for me. I really love that part. But uh, many another um, uh, groom and bride they choose to add elements on like a nice lay. Uh, so I like to include those lays. Like even if they have some time, the exchange of lays separate from the first kiss, uh, uh, I like to include the lays always when it's possible, right? So the, let's say if they, if they want to personalize from the way they say, okay, we want the first kiss, but they have the first kiss picture without the lays, I like to include the lays yeah. if I have another picture of the lays, right? Um, so, Usually they don't want to include the officiant, but every time when they allow me to include the officiant, uh, and the uh, and the officiant is uh, somebody who is Kanaka and is wearing some traditional uh, clothes, uh, I like to include that, especially if they're like uh, blowing the conch, and uh, that's that's very nice too. Um, 
it it mostly depends on the couple and what is their decision. Uh, but I think the spirit of Hawaii for me, uh, if I don't find any obvious element uh, on the composition, I try to uh, put that intention into the background, either like the beauty of the island, the luminosity. I, I'm not realistic on my paintings. I try to be more expressive on the colors and the colors that I choose, they try to express that brightness that uh, uh, for me, uh, the Hawaiian landscape reflects. And uh, it's not just the love for the traditions and, 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 and the people original from Hawaii that I really like is also the, the, the blessings of this uh, beautiful weather and the, and the landscape and that's kind of like very universal. Everybody can recognize that. But I also try to put a little bit of like uh, the spirit of Hawaii in a, I guess, an emotional way that is uh, the love and respect that I feel for the islands and the people from here. It, it it really shows through, um, and and I'm looking at the site, and it really shows through. And I I love how you also can capture not only these stunning portraits and beautiful background, but you also can do caricatures, little caricatures of the couple as well. Yeah, yeah. So that's another service because um, I'm not uh, like a caricature artist that is going to do something. Uh, very like uh, grotesque or like uh, exaggeration, so like the ugly parts of this person. So my, yeah. my portrait caricatures are mostly like uh, a bubble head, right? So it's like a big head yeah. and small body, right? So it, it's no, it, it's not so hilarious, <laughs> but uh, um, people really like those because uh, they they see themselves. And uh, in a beautiful way. And when the people they're celebrating the, the, their weddings, I feel like that's what they want to see. And I'm not so much as a cartoon artist, as, like to do something grotesque. I'm more like a portrait artist. So I found like a like a middle uh, uh, middle ground right there, right? So I, I like to do I that agree. Type of caricatures. Yes. Yeah, they, and they people have love it. backgrounds too. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So um, I like to add some elements, as I mentioned before, like uh, it's personalized, right? So uh, yeah. if the people allow me, uh, sometimes there are people from the mainland, they have no sensitivity at all with the islands. And right. I, I need to be always respectful with my clients. It, you know, uh, they, they're celebrating love and they're celebrating their, their ceremony. And they have sometimes and other requirements like their own cultural background. So I'm being already on three different weddings of people who choose Hawaii to have their wedding because one person is from Australia and another person is from the United States. And they huh? find the middle place right here when all, all both families can come to celebrate their wedding. And you huh? know that those three uh, couples, they also have... Uh, somebody who has a link with the island, right? So it's usually somebody who moved to Hawaii and end up traveling to Australia and meeting their couple in Australia. And, and one of the last caricatures that I did, uh, I, I like to paint like a little, uh, to, to do a little illustration of the couple when I can, uh, yeah. separate from the live caricatures that I do at, at the event. So I, I take a little bit longer time to do a color caricature usually of the couple with their cultural background. And uh, so it's like a mix of Australian and American. And, uh -huh. uh, and, I, and I put those elements together on the illustration and I print that on the back side of each live caricature that I give to the guest. Oh, that's fantastic. Really fantastic. Uh, well, I know you were, we, we've got a couple minutes left and I know you were very involved in Kakua for Maui, uh, a day to remember. Can you please share what it was like being in, engaged and, and serving during that event? Uh, I'm so sorry. I, I, what I can remember right now is the art shows 
of the emergence both by the viewpoint galleries and Macawal and the one foot forward. Uh, the Kokua for Maui. I'm so sorry. It's just uh, I, I know it's what. all it's all a, it's all a blur. <laughs> There's so many things that have happened since the yeah. wildfires. Well, I, I know that you were you were reaching out uh, and and serving during during this time of the wildfires and and helping to unite people through your art and maybe if you could just kind of describe because it sounds like you've done multiple of that maybe you can just kind of share a little bit about what that's been like yeah so um as you can imagine it's been stressful for all the community even people who weren't impacted directly by the fire they're they're being impacted by like the lack of bookings on uh, the, the the lack of tourism that we've been having like uh, right after the fire and um, even this year it's been lower than another years and it's kind of like overlapping with the impact that we had before with COVID so I, I guess like everybody's comparing numbers with 2019 uh, yeah. so uh, I it's I'm being trying to be present and, and, and every time if I can give an interview and give my perspective, I'm being trying to do that because at the, the right after the fires, a lot of misinformation was circulating and uh, a lot of uh, people was pointing fingers like to the police because people started like, spreading things about like road closures that they uh, were done like with, uh, I don't know if it, it was like, ne- people was accusing of ne- ne- neglect and yeah. or like bad intentions and even conspiracy theories. Oh, but like, okay. why was like the, oh. the, the road close or something like that? So, uh, Ariel, I tried I'm to so give sorry. A we're going to, we're going to have to wrap up, um, as the show, show is ending. So, uh, I, I want to thank you for, for being on, uh, the show and oh, for your amazing you so work. Yeah, and so I want to let you're time. very welcome. Thank you, Thank and you and so want to let everybody know MauiWeddingArt.com. Maui Wedding Art. Look at Ariel's work. You're gonna, I just love it. Uh, it, it the, the portraits are beautiful. Uh, they clearly capture the couple well. You're gonna find some caricatures as well. But look at Ariel's work. Um, very diverse artist. That if you have a special event, any occasion, really. Um, look at uh, capturing that Jew Ariel and his amazing work at Maui Wedding Art. You know, the show always goes fast. I, I, could, uh, I would love to talk to Ariel longer, too. Uh, but I hope that you all have enjoyed the show today. We hope you'll join us again next Thursday for Business Matters.